Okay. Let's make some art today. <laughs> Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. And today we are going to look at the art of another incredible artist and do our darndest to recreate it. We are going to be looking at the art of perhaps most the most famous artist of all time, uh, or at least as, uh, undoubtedly from the 19th or 20th century, right? Pablo Picasso. And today is week or day number three of Pablo Picasso week. So over the last few days, we have already recreated two paintings of his. We began with the old guitarist from 1903, probably one of the seminal works of the blue period. And on Tuesday, we recreated this painting, Child with the Dove, from 1901. So it actually is a little bit earlier than the old guitarist. And today we are going to leave the blue period, a, 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 a time of, of intense depression, poverty, loneliness, and sadness for Picasso, and move into what is called the Rose period. And the Rose period coincides with a, a new relationship for Picasso. Fernand uh, was uh, his mistress. <laughs> Uh, he had many mistresses, many wives, many mistresses. We'll talk about uh, his personality as we go, as we have the last few episodes. But um, this, uh, the the Rose period is uh, a blossoming of creativity. Not that he wasn't being very creative during the Blue period. Many of those paintings are some of his most famous paintings of all time. But Picasso is this incredible artist who just keeps on getting better and better and better and more innovative, more creative as he goes. And the Rose period is a, an, a, really the transition point where the cubism starts to formulate, uh, maybe more so than anywhere in just the colors of itself and also the flexibility that he starts feeling with abstracting the human figure. So let's uh, um, let's jump right into it. So there is a outline for today's episode, which you can download and print out for free and trace onto a canvas to get your start yourself started. I'm going to show you where that is in a second. I also did a second outline for another painting that I'm not going to have time to do today, but if you are interested, that outline here it is and there is the actual image itself. Um, another performer, this time rather than an acrobat or harlequin, this one is called the actor. Uh, also just just quick little plug for the upcoming shows. On Saturday we are going to be moving into Picasso's Cubist period and we're going to be painting the three musicians and then on Monday in honor of Picasso's birthday we are going to be painting this painting, The Weeping Woman, uh, which he painted while he was working on Guernica. And this is long after the Cubist period, but at this point he's just using all sorts of different types of abstraction in the image. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a look here. I'll show you how to transfer this image. I'm gonna mute, or sorry, not mute, but I'm gonna make this go full screen. And there's the old guitarist. Here, let's let this play. So you can see here, I'm using a nine by 12 size canvas. The reason I was just tearing some of that paper off is that I generally gesso all of these canvas boards. I put a layer of gesso on, let it dry, and then I sand it with 220 grit sandpaper just to get the painting a little bit smoother. And then now I'm taping the the printout, which you can print out from a photocopier at work or your home inkjet or laser jet printer onto regular photocopy paper. And then I'm using some carbon paper to trace out the tracing that I did onto canvas, right? And I'm not gonna play the whole thing because it's pretty straightforward. You get the idea. 
uh, was maybe like nine out of ten lines I put on there. And you'll also see that maybe just before I, I pull that off, you can see I didn't do the patterning on the clothes. I figure, you know, I'll do that later on. It's just going to get covered while I'm doing the outline. So let's just skip that that whole step entirely. So you're left with an image that looks like this. You've got your outline. You've got your other outline should you want to use it for another painting. Because some of you just can't quite get enough, right? So we'll begin that way. Also, I just forgot to mention, we did a totally random painting yesterday. We painted Bigfoot yesterday. We did this one in about an hour and a half. So if you're interested in doing, you're not really into Picasso, uh, you want to paint something totally different, here's Bigfoot. <laughs> so let's just take these paintings out of the way here. We'll move them off to the side. And let's get this whole thing started. So typically what I do with every single painting and this is just a bit of a trademark thing of mine, is to put this warm yellow onto the canvas first. And it's, it's uh, traditionally artists would probably put a warm red or, or, or warm brown, I mean, or a rusty red. I like to use this warm yellow. And it, the, the difference by the end of the painting is so minor that, especially for a beginner artist, I don't think most people would even know the difference. Um, but it's also just a lot easier to, to just squeeze some warm yellow out of a tube, put a little bit of water on it, boom, put it on the canvas. The imprematura, as the Italians called it, who were the ones to originate this type of process, in the kind of maybe pre-Renaissance period. Um, have, so everyone from Leonardo da Vinci to Salvador Dali to Claude Monet to, I mean, Vincent van Gogh, Vincent van Gogh as most people would call him, uh, have used this type of a process to jumpstart the painting. I recommend that you do something like this quite strongly because I think you'll just find, especially if you're a beginner artist, that it just instantly elevates your painting and gives it a bit more of a professional kind of quality. It sort of like acts like, in a, in a strange way, even though we cover almost every little bit of this yellow up, it acts almost like a bit of like a... Uh, of, of a frame in that it, it elevates just any painting into something just a little bit more professional and unique. So I'm going to put it there to the side and let it dry. Now that it's completely covered with paint, I'm going to dry my brush off or clean my brush. You can see I wiped off the excess paint before I did anything else. That way my water doesn't, I don't have to change my water ever. You see me paint for, I've, I've done a couple of these episodes that have lasted about seven and a half hours and didn't clean my water once and didn't feel any need to clean my water at any particular point. Wow, I was I just reloaded the chat because I was like, it's pretty quiet. And yes, there's lots of things in the chat already. Cool. Um, and I saw, oh, you know what, let's, so, you know what, before I totally skipped my normal plan, which is to usually, I let people know where you can get your Dropbox, the, the, the outline from the Dropbox. So if we go to the master study folder, there's a link to it in the description below, you will see all of these names in here of artists that we've already covered and will cover. We go to, oh, that's an earlier Picasso that we did here. We go to uh, inside folder 80 to 84, and you're going to see all these different images. Of course, there's um, the one we're doing is number three here with the, the PDF and JPEG version of the outline. 
I should also let you know that there is a private Facebook group just for people like yourself who are watching and painting along with me. And I was just noticing in the chat, everyone asking Donna how she's doing. And uh, yesterday we learned that Donna had an accident and has broken a couple of discs and in her back, which is in, uh, very serious. So everyone is wishing her a speedy recovery. So good luck, Donna, on that. Uh, hopefully you'll be back painting with us soon. Yeah, I'll just also, the great thing about the Facebook page is people who are painting what we're doing in class and also working on their own artwork. And I just love all of these paintings. Way to go, Gail. Uh, Heidi, awesome. So, you know, I, there's a whole bunch of new people that joined just over the past couple of days. So join, share your photo of your painting that you make today, regardless if it's something we're working on today, Picasso's painting or something else you're working on that inspires you and you can get some great feedback and support and encouragement from all these other artists at different points of the creative journey let's uh let's look here at picasso's biography really quickly so we've already talked quite extensively about picasso's early life and his relationship with his father who is also a painter an exquisite artist in and of himself so we're not going to bother covering that. You can watch the first two episodes to get a little bit more information about that. Um, but as I said, we're moving now into the Rose period. And really, I mean, Picasso at this age, by the way, is only like 20, 23, we're on the verge of turning 24 when he moves into the Rose period. So he's already had the Blue period, which is... You know, for many artists, would be an entire career's worth, like, and and would make them a fairly well-known artist. Picasso has about five major periods of art in his career, and now, at, in his early twenties, he's now moving into the Rose period, shortly to follow after with with what is known as his African period for about five years and then cubism at the end of the decade. So this is a period of, of much brighter, happier, joyful artwork. Um, you know, at the turn of the century, there's a lot of, of people doing research onto color theory and into um, and ascribing meaning to different colors. And, and there's still people who, who firmly believe this, and there's researchers who've written PhD theses all about this, but that certain colors have inherent meanings to them. And that's one of the reasons that Picasso chose blue as one of the, as the main color for his blue period to kind of talk about this malaise, this depression that he was in. And then as he's moving out of it and his mental state is improving, he selects pink as uh, a much more joyful, exuberant, happy color to reflect this change in his state of mind. And again, so there's, you know, there's reasons why hospitals paint their walls certain colors, right? Versus other colors, because they believe that that improves the, um, the the temperament the attitude the feelings the atmosphere inside the spaces and then of course on the patients themselves right so picasso is you know he's tapped into pretty much like everything going on he's a voracious reader he's going out all the time to restaurants and bars he's fairly successful so he's also getting invited to to parties where he's meeting scientists and doctors who are collecting his work and he's um, he's absorbing as much information as possible. So this uh, connection between pink the, or rose is uh, falls directly in line with a lot of the current research at the time. Okay, so let's... Um, I thought it might be just worth just checking out, as I, as I mentioned, Fernand was uh, Picasso's lover uh, at the time when the Rose period begins and she is also uh, she she passed away in the 60s uh, actually before Picasso died and was an accomplished artist herself as well as a model so she also posed for lots of different artists you know Picasso painted her over 60 times 
you know, their relationship was tumultuous, as his relationships with all women were, and um, she uh, she wrote an autobiography about her time with with Picasso, um, and yeah, we've we've talked extensively about the P Picasso's misogynism, and he was he was a, a pretty nasty person to to every woman who had. The fortune or misfortune, depending on the way you want to look at it, to interact with him. Um, there's lots of links in the description below if you want a little information about the, this particular painting. Um, I just want to mention there's this is a, a pretty good short little video by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, talking about an exhibition they had a, a decade ago on Picasso, but really focusing, I think, primarily on his earlier... Well, it's it's an exhibition of all of the work of Picasso in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but they have a really great collection in... or as part of that collection, they have a lot of his Rose Period paintings. So, uh, because Picasso is becoming more and more well-known and getting the attention of international collectors at this point, and these are the freshest paintings that he's that are coming out of the studio so they're getting snapped up and so they're moving abroad they're in new york they're in moscow so uh, besides just staying in europe so in fact there's very few paintings of his period of this period in um, in france or england etc um i thought i would just mention if you're really interested in picasso's young this youthful period of his life. This is an excellent book by the by the author Norman Mailer. You've probably heard of Norman Mailer before. Uh, I, Norman Mailer's sort of known as sort of this tough guy author. Uh, I think you know he really sort of fancied himself as like a uh, Hemingway kind of personality. And it's no surprise that Norman Mailer would write a book on Picasso, another sort of ultra masculine kind of. Uh, to the point of, of almost absurdity kind of character. But this is an excellent book. I remember reading this book probably 20 years ago since I read it, but I remember just being like, wow, because uh, I think this is the first Norman Mailer, Norman Mailer book that I ever read, and, and I was like, oh, I was really surprised. It seems like it's a, quite a well-researched um, book. It, it makes Picasso's youth, it's it's sort of a page-turner. It's, it's, a, it's a great little story. Um, so it really sort of talks about this exact period of time, the blue period and the rose period, and then the leading up to uh, cubism. And we'll talk about this more on Saturday when we get into cubism, but I just, for not everybody's going to watch that episode. So one of the, the, the major incidents in Picasso, or in Norman Mailer's book about Picasso, is the famous theft of the Mona Lisa I think it was like 1911 yeah so at this point Picasso is now firmly into his cubist period but uh, during this time the Mona Lisa is stolen from the Louvre and it is an international incident it's really also the moment that the Mona Lisa becomes famous uh, but I what is really interesting is just how that happens. Picasso is arrested and, and strongly suspected of being the, uh, the the thief of the Mona Lisa, which would be like if, you know, Picasso is, is becoming one of the more famous artists, certainly in Paris, if not the world. So it would be like, not, I was trying to, like, it's not as if Tom Cruise was arrested for a major theft, but it would be like a Timothy Chalamet, right, a, a young actor who is about to star in the new Dune movie. You could imagine like a young uh, uh, star all of a sudden being arrested. Anyway, we'll talk all about that on Saturday, but it is a, it is a fascinating story. Okay, so let's get right into the painting here. Um, actually, let's get some paint on the palette, and then we'll we'll make the painting. So as you know, I like to use all of my paints can fit inside of a shoebox, and then there's still lots of room left over for a pair of shoes, perhaps, right? So let's uh, put some paint on here. If you want to use the exact paints that I'm using, there's a link in the video description below to order them directly from Amazon. Although I would suggest you 
buy them from your local art supply store because you'll probably get a better deal. Now, even though this is the rose period, I'm going to be putting every color in my palette on here because we've got a lot of browns in today's painting. And to mix a brown, we need blue and uh, yellow as well. And I, you can see I just put some white down there. I do have black when I, but I've had this tube of black paint for maybe three years. I rarely use black in my paintings. And today's, I do see potentially one or two little places where we could add black, but even then, I don't know. I'd be, um, I don't think we'll use much of it if we even do. Rather than opening, you know, I got lots of extra tubes of paint here, but rather than opening up a new tube, I'm going to use a little bit of this cool yellow that I squeezed out of another tube of paint that I afterwards threw out. All right, so this is how I, how I deal with those little remnants that are inside a tube of paint. If you're painting it for a while, you're going to have lots of extra little bits of paint that, and I just, as I said, every time... I throw paint down the sink or, or into the garbage, a l I think a little tiny art fairy dies, right? So I want to use up all of my paint if possible. And that's why I also only put about as much paint on my palette as I, I will uh, put toothpaste on my toothbrush, right? Some of you are probably like, wow, you really put a lot of toothpaste on your toothbrush. Okay, I'm going to blow dry the canvas here and mute the microphone for about five seconds. Okay, I see in the chat you guys are talking about uh, Deborah's painting where she transformed uh, Cornelius Craighoff's painting into a hobbit. That was awesome. I love that. It's, you'll have to join the Facebook group to see it. So if you're watching this and you're wondering what I'm talking about, I'm not going to show it because it's there. you got to go find it. Okay, so uh, how should we begin this painting? If we look at it, traditionally what I do is go right into the background, paint the background, even the, this area, which is technically the foreground, but I all, but I can sort of separate the figures from the ground, and so I'm going to paint some colder colors back here, and then warmer colors into the foreground. And you know, just looking at this painting, you know, the this blue back here is undeniably a cool blue. Um, this red here is undeniably a warm red. Now. These, this looks like a, this, or, this red here is a little bit colder. I imagine it's probably going to be a mix between our two reds. This pink is a bit more of a cool pink. This blue is also, I think, a, kind of in between our warm and cool blues. But these browns, these are some warmer browns for sure. So... Like we've talked about for, or in, the, in the previous two Picasso paintings, Picasso at this stage, you know, he's 20, as I said, how old would he be? 20, so now he's about 25 years old. 
you know, and like any, you know, er, person in their early twenties is in uh, is a full grown rebel, and he's he's when trained by his father to make all these incredible paintings. But he, over the, since the blue period, he's basically tried to throw out everything his father taught him and trying to find his own way of doing things. And he's so some of these quote unquote rules that we've been talking about warm and cool colors and putting cool colors in the background and warm colors in the foreground. Picasso's really playing with that and he's moving things around. Um, also, I think probably just out of curiosity. You know, I think, you know, if you're taught, like, this is the way you have to do it. And he's now living on his own. He's been out, he's moved out of his his parents' house about, you know, what, uh, six or seven years after that. So he's, there's no one looking over his shoulder saying, you know, no, no, you can't do that, which is what his father was had done for a decade. And so I think he's just really playing, experimenting, having fun. And then, as I said, all of this culminates five years later with the birth of cubism where he just throws the whole idea of foreground and background completely out the window which revolutionizes not just art but uh, arguably uh, the way that we see things as well okay so uh, let's start mixing some colors here so let's we'll do the the background we'll do our cool blue in the background to get started and let's zoom down in Oop, not maybe that far let's see how close okay that's not bad and let's see these two side by side here so I'm going to take my cool blue and some white and mix these together Now, generally, I do a couple of coats of, of paint, but I'm kind of feeling that maybe I'll leave... Well, we'll see. Uh, because, you know, one of the reasons I do two coats of paint is to get a really nice, solid color. But I'm kind of feeling with this painting that maybe having a little bit of the yellow coming through in places just wouldn't be so bad. Now, I also think that what Picasso did here is to paint, he painted this whole background like this. You can see there's blue under here, there's blue under here. So I would be willing to bet, and maybe even a bit of blue under here, it wouldn't surprise me at all if most of this painting actually had this cool blue under there somewhere. So I'm just going to paint right over top of those flowers. Because you can see how there's a little bit of blue in between the flowers. And there's some blue under here too. So I'm just going to kind of go right through there. Like it kind of looks to me like this is a late addition to the painting. The, that sort of plinth with flowers on top. And I know there's this kind of pink thing here, but I'm gonna paint on top of that as well. So, again, all of this would be, be baby blue, but for the sake of not completely uh, making this too difficult for people, maybe, maybe I'll just leave it there. As I said, I, I, I bet you a hundred bucks that at least this blue goes down to here. 
Um, but just so that you know what I'm let's uh, should I do this yeah okay so I'm just gonna do it <laughs> and we'll just paint it back right because that's what Picasso did I got a little bit I'm just remixing that color gonna kind of go more a little bit more delicately over this here so I'll be able to find it but it's there's still got a little bit of blue underneath there Same thing if I come down here. There's definitely some blue on the back here. Okay, so you can see that it's I, I'm it's a little bit of an uneven background that I've painted, but I don't mind that because we see that in here. We can see where there's a bit. Let's actually just zoom in. Can you see how there's a bit of a yellowy ground underneath this? It kind of looks greenish, but I'm pretty confident that's not. I mean, there might be a little bit of green that he painted over top of that, but I think that might be the original color underneath. So, we'll see. We'll, we'll let this dry and then see what happens as we go. So let's move down to the bottom of the painting down here. And so maybe before we do that, can we see anything happen? Look at all the drips going on here. Like that's pretty radical. Like, look at all this is some, this is a drip that's gone right through, and that turpentine has removed the red of the paint. So, and here's Picasso painting and wiping things away. So this is he's really kind of going wild in this painting. So when I look down here, I see a bit of like a purple. So I think what I'm going to do is actually paint some purple in the bottom of the painting and then we'll put some brown over top of it later so to do that I'm going to take this red uh, cool red and warm blue All right, let's mix just a little bit more of it now that we know what we want And just to help cover up a bit of the yellow, I'm going to add a bit of white into here. Okay. Right, don't worry about making it look all cool and pretty because we're not going to see it. it's going to go it'll be brown by the end of the painting right and even if it's a little bit uneven that works in our favor generally we want it to look kind of nice and and clean but not in the way that Picasso paints Picasso likes a little bit of that of this 
I don't know, uh, messy approach. He really likes, it's almost like he's, there's a bravura a kind of like, brav, like trying to, like he's, he shows off a little bit by, by allowing the viewer to see a little bit of the, of the construction of the painting, of the, the underneath layers. And this painting's no different. Okay, so these browns here. Um, I think what we should do, well, I'll have to blow dry this for sure, but um, to get this kind of a brown, because we also, I'm, once I mix this brown that goes here, I'm gonna add some white in it and we'll paint into these areas. So I might blow dry things quickly here. So let me just dry this brush off. And just a real quick blow dry so that I can paint my brown over top of here. Take a sip of tea. Okay, so we're gonna mix a. Uh, well, this is a warm brown. I'm just thinking. I mean, ideally, you know what I. I mean, ideally, what I should have done is just painted all of this blue. But if I was doing that, I would do that on my own. But really, since we don't have. I didn't want to lose everybody by just starting to paint. So you know what? I think I'm going to put a cold brown under here and then sub then Yeah, let's do that. Just so that we can continue to have some warm and cool colors in opposition and create a little bit of depth. So let's take some cool yellow. Let's take some cool red. Let's mix that up. And then take a bit of cool blue. See how dominant that blue is. It really turned it green very quickly. So that means we need a lot more cool red. So let's mix, I'm gonna mix even more of this. I'm going to take some white. And I'm just lightening it up a little bit. So now we've got this cool brown. We're going to mix a warm brown in a few minutes, but I think it might be just helpful just to start with this 
here. So I know this is a little bit darker and and not quite dark enough. It's okay. We're just building up layers, right? This is what Picasso is famous for. Building up layers of paint. And this is this is one of those things that he learned from his father cuz his father was a very traditional uh, realist or naturalist painter. Okay. And now I'm going to take some glazing fluid. Right, so this is my satin glazing fluid. It means, or it's another word is matte glazing fluid. It's not shiny. Uh, and so I'm gonna take that and, and it's going to extend this paint. So I mean, all of a sudden I got a lot more paint, but now it's gonna be a lot more transparent. In fact, I'm gonna add a bit more here. And um, Gently kind of peel a bit of that back. It's not exactly the right color yet. We're going to put a different, a warmer um, brown over top of it, which is a lot more like a skin tone. But here we've got a really nice colder brown. And browns, you know, there's the, the, the difference between you know, a warm and a cool brown is kind of, is very minor. But uh, there is a difference. And so we're just we're making sure that we get that difference. Now I'm just going to take this same brown with a little bit of that glaze. And I'm just going to go over top of this as well. So I might just take my rag and just take a bit of
Cool. Um, so there we are. We're what that you know maybe twenty minutes in, and we've got a really nice foundational uh, uh, beginning to this painting, at least in the background so far, right? Now let's take a, an attempt at the figures here. So the figures, we've got warm reds. I, you know, when I look at this, I'm trying to think like, how did he do this red? Um, it looks like there's a kind of a brown underneath here. So I think what he did is he used the same brown that he put here and he painted this figure with that brown. But see, he, he might have even used that same cool blue that's in the background on the face as well. I'm not entirely sure. But we, like when we painted the child with the dove the other day, we did the same sort of thing. We painted a darker color and then painted kind of a thicker white over top of it. Yeah, I think this brown that we see here is what he put underneath here. So very strange, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I'm, I've been a bit baffled looking at some of these Picasso paintings. Like he's definitely, doing very weird decision making which is you know probably why his paintings looked very unique at the time and why they still have some kind of undefinable uniqueness to this day is that he's doing things with color that I don't I can't really think of too many artists that that use color in this way and and you know, again, it, I mean, I don't know what another example would be, but like, I'm trying to think of a musician who's like, uh, you know, it'd be so, something like somebody who first used an electric guitar or something, like something that you're not supposed to do, and all of a sudden, totally weird and different sounds are coming out, and no one else understands what's going on. Okay. So I'm going to take this blue, bring it in here to this brown. So it's right now it's going a bit orangey, right? So, you know, you could be like a doctor and try and diagnose what is wrong with this brown. If the brown that I want to get is here, why do I have a bit of a, a greenish brown? Well, that's because I've got either too much yellow or more likely too much warm blue. So let's put a bit more warm blue in here. Okay, and then we go, wow, that's kind of red. Why is that still so red? Maybe we want it to be a bit of a darker brown, so let's take a bit more blue. All right, and then we gotta go a little bit more red. Back and forth until you get the mixture you like. Okay, so I'm going to use this color, at least initially, I think it could even go a bit more darker, I think. Um, let me just take a bit more blue in there, okay, I think that's good. So let's take this nice dark warm brown. In fact, why don't we just start zooming in? Uh, let's bring this down. All right, and oh, well, that still looks very. See, it's what's doing is it's combining with these other colors here. So I want a bit more red.
and even then it's still a little bit darker. So let's get this blue in here. And I think I'll glaze over, to, I'm gonna use glaze at least in the, the, the blue in the sky. So we'll put this here for now. It does look like a little bit more of a colder blue than I was expecting it to be. But. And then you can see it's getting drier as he goes across here. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, let's go a little bit higher up here, hey? Eh? Okay. <laughs> I see in the chat, uh, F.A. says, oh my god, this is the coolest page ever. I can't believe all the amazing painting painting tutorials you have. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, F.A. Um, I hope to hope you uh, make a few of those paintings with us. That would be great to have you join, join the group. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now what I want to do is I want to tackle this color that's in the background, this kind of a peachy color. And... I could mix it in with this color, but I think I'm going to use basically a similar version of it for the faces anyway, so why don't we just mix it all at once. So I'm just wiping all this excess paint off, I'm going to clean my brush because there's a pretty dark brown that I just got on there. So now let's take our warm yellow. Well, it's a little bit too much warm red, but that's okay. Maybe let's do this separately right here. And a little bit of, tiny bit of, warm, like you could see when I say tiny bit, right? Tiny, tiny bit of warm blue. And then let's take some white. In fact, I'm just gonna do this right down here. Need a bit more warm red. Looking at this color, um, I think I want to, rather than just paint this directly on here, let's just get some of that excess off. I'm going to use some glazing fluid and mix it into the paint. This way I'm going to get a bit, a much more of a transparent layer, just as we did previously. gently some of that excess to get back to that blue maybe even a little bit more okay Come down here with this 
same thing. Now my brush is like very dry, so I can just use it to very loosely get in those areas. And maybe even just going over in here a little bit. Is all wet paint in here, which is a little bit dangerous because things I could make a mess. But I just want to continue. You know, I think this is this is all kind of the stuff that Picasso would do: is just play around a little bit and just see what happens. And if it didn't turn out the way he wanted, he would just paint over it. He could care less. He was. I think he he really enjoyed learning and seeing how what would happen and that made him like an absolute master technically uh, with paint in a way that you know very very few other artists uh, were capable of doing like so Picasso because he knew how to mix paint so well how to apply paint and he had experimented in so many different ways that he had an incredible like he he had mastered the craft which allowed him to express himself very very easily so like in the example would be like a like a great writer or novelist someone who has an incredible command of language that is never at a loss for words they've all they've got the you know no matter what kind of feeling emotion adjective you're trying to think of they've got it and they've got five different slightly more nuanced versions and they can boom 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 and right it's so picasso is the same thing like he more than like the only other artist i can think of that that knew like of 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 this period that that knew paint as well as Picasso would be Salvador Dali. Salvador Dali is another artist that just like Picasso, you may not like their art, you may not like them as people, but you just simply can't deny that there's that they were the absolute best from a technical perspective than any other artist alive at the time, right? And that's why Dali was able to paint things out of his imagination, dreams, things that were impossible because he and he could make them look real or surreal, right? More than real because he could paint anything that was real incredibly well. And Picasso's the same way, right? He might be playing with things and distorting the body, but because he knew how to paint so well, he could make it look believable and not just sloppy and lazy or you know that not a mistake but like wow something this figure is painted in a really awkward way but it there's something about it that works right and very few other artists could say that about their work so oh i was going to paint what i mixed this brown right and i was going to use it to paint the figures a while ago and i totally forgot about that so i'm going to take this you know it's i've now mixed a different color and been painting doing something else for 15 minutes but that's okay because I just want the glazing fluid and this dark brown, meaning I'm going to get kind of a semi-transparent brown out of this. And I'm going to paint this whole figure like this, right? And because I've got that glazing fluid in here, I can still see all my lines underneath, no problem. Now I do think that his he would have painted this a little bit darker than I'm painting it. I'm just kind of going a little bit lighter because I want people to be able to see what's going on underneath here. All right, I'm gonna go right up into the face. You know, another thing with Picasso, like if I was to make a mistake and paint something accidentally 
onto the blue in, in the background, into that sky area. For a lot of different artists and their techniques, that would be just majorly frustrating. And, uh, you know, then I'd have to do, like, spend a little while trying to quote-unquote fix things. For Picasso, he wouldn't mind that at all. In fact, he might kind of like that. He might be like, oh, now people will see that I put that color into the sky and that there's lots of layers in here. Like, what would be an example? You know, like, my wife and I love watching, um, uh, like, cooking competition shows, like Top Chef or um, uh, Restaurant Impossible, Kitchen Nightmares, all those different kinds of shows. Um, Hell's, what does that call it? Hell's, Hell's Kitchen, I think it's called, yeah. Um, anything Gordon Ramsay, uh, and you know, there's there are certain kinds of chefs that that you know use all sorts of different spices, and and by the end you're like, I can't. It's really hard to tell like what's going on. And there's certain artists or or chefs that are like, everything is very clear. We can tell, you know, even the most, you know. Um, uh, uneducated palate like I have like um, can go like hmm there's like cinnamon in this like everything's very obvious Picasso is sort of very obvious he he embraces the the brush stroke he loves it when people see those little things going on. he doesn't attempt to disguise anything I think he because I th I think again Picasso, even from a young age, he's surrounded by older people. Um, he's selling his art to older collectors, and he's listening to what they have to say. And a lot of collectors, and a lot of people to this day, really prize the sort of Protestant work ethic, right? Oh, you know, when you hear, oh, this painting took somebody eight months to paint, people are like, wow, it must be really good then, right? And so Picasso is like, huh, that's interesting. People respect artwork if it took the artist a long time to make it. So how can I make my art look like it took a long time? Well, one thing I can do is, is to do a lot of little tiny details and it'll look like I labored over it for hours and hours, right? That's one way of doing it. That's the way the Renaissance painters, Leonardo, Michelangelo... Leonardo particularly spending years on the Mona Lisa, for instance, right? So Picasso, very smart guy, is like, well, I want to make a lot of money. So I don't want to be sitting around making one painting a year or one painting every four years. I want to make one painting every day, maybe three paintings a day, maybe 20 paintings a week. Picasso used to have the world record for the most amount of artworks created. Somebody beat him by going into the New York subway and making drawings on post-it notes and selling them for a dollar. You can look it up. It's right. Um, so Picasso, he's smart. And I haven't thought about this until I'm just thinking about it now, which is one of the reasons why I love doing this is because I step into someone's shoes and all of a sudden all these light bulbs go off. He says, I'm sure he's thinking to himself, well... I don't want to spend that much time making paintings, so how can I make these paintings that I want to do quickly look like they took a long time? Well, one is to not, is to show my work, is to not hide it. So if I do a few layers of paint, rather than disguising it to make it look, getting rid of all my brush strokes, I'll allow those little things to come through. And then when people look at it, they're like, oh, it looks like even though the sky's blue, there's some yellow in there and there's some red. and. Oh, there's some brown, oh, some green in here. And for, for people, it makes them think like, oh, wow, there's lots of layers. Lots of layers means lots of time. Lots of time means lots of work. Lots of work means, because when I go to work and I work a long time at my job, I expect to get paid more for more work, right? So again, I'm just this, these are things that now just seem very clear to me as I'm, I've been painting Picasso this week. Very, very interesting. Okay, so... And other people watching are like, are you going to paint anything more? Or are you just going to talk? Okay. So, uh, let's see. What should we do next? I think... 
Uh, the this color is pretty good. I mean, I think I could have added maybe a little bit more white, but that's also because I put some glazing fluid. I might be, maybe this needs a little, maybe let's do that and then we'll move, we'll be almost done the background, I think. So let's take this same warm color, maybe get a bit more white on it, as I just mentioned. Maybe just a tiny bit more red. And... Right, because you can see that this area is distinct from a number of the other surfaces here. So I want to make sure I get that. take another paintbrush and kind of scrub a bit here, right? Maybe a bit of this down here now that I'm looking at it. Just realizing that line is more like right here, isn't it? back to the figure I think right now I'll go yeah because we've we've done a lot in the background there is obviously stuff down here that I want to do more of but I think we need to get into the figure at this point right so I'm gonna go down to a much smaller brush now and let's take some of this warm red I'm going to take some warm blue and maybe actually I'm going to do this over here. I'm going to take my warm red and cool blue and I get this really nice dark color. And because they're almost opposite from the on the color wheel from one another, we get a really dark color that has very little um, saturation to it. So I'm going to use this as a bit of, uh, it's almost like adding black to a color here in a moment. So I'm just going to clean the excess off my brush. And then I'm going to go back to this red. I'm a little bit tempted to add a bit of yellow in here, cool yellow. I think I'm going to do a few coats of it.
can still see everything underneath. And if I paint over some of these blue areas, in fact, let's just zoom in. the lines will actually get a little bit darker. Guy's hips just got a bit bigger suddenly, accidentally. I could fix that. Mm. Maybe I will. I'll just take a bit of a rag here. Ugh. Need to use a new rag. That one's all crusty. So let's. Time is now ticking because now I've got this paint is drying. Hmm. And just caused probably more trouble than it was worth. I'll paint some I still have that color here so I'll take I'll tackle that in a moment but that's all go all the way down to the bottom now put this in here like I think I'll I'm gonna give a little bit more nuance to the shape of these legs as we go but there is also my outline. Sometimes I find it helpful just to kind of... Ah! Sorry. Okay. Well, it's not bad. Let's, uh... We go up to the to the the hat of the the uh, acrobat here. Oops, let's come down.
Maybe while well, should I tackle a little bit of these flowers while I'm I've got red on my paintbrush? Yeah, let's do that. these I'm not even gonna bother modifying this um, red because I'll put other uh, probably glaze a little bit over top of that so it'll change as well okay so let's let's go to the the young Harlequin here so this red it's similar to the red that we've just painted but we want to go, um, we want to modify it a little bit. And in fact, I'm just thinking to myself, maybe I should draw out a little bit of the patterning on here. I was, I originally didn't do that because I thought we'll probably cover this up, but we haven't. So. Getting some of these on his arm might be tricky. So I might just do... Um, I'm just trying to think of how we can avoid getting too complicated little shapes on this figure's body. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Donna says, I have to say good night. I can't stay awake any longer. Well, uh, you need a little bit of rest anyway, Donna, so get well. Um, Deborah says, I must say good night. Also, we were out kayaking yesterday. And push yourself a little hard. I want to make this painting for my son's birthday. Uh, but I'm still finishing the old guitarist. So thank you for all you teach us and, and encouraging us. I appreciate that. Thanks, Deborah. Okay. So now what I want to do is I'm going I want to mix You know what? I Finally, these brushes arrived in the mail just earlier today. So these are just cheap brushes. You can get these, I think they're like $10, $12 at Michael's Art Supply. I ordered these off of Amazon. I think they're a little more on Amazon. I think they're like $16. And they took for like two months to get here. Um, but these are the first new brushes I've bought for this show in a year. It's really stuck in here. Um, but it, it just, it, it's a good reminder that you don't need expensive brushes to paint anything, right? So this is the same brush after a year. Look how it's worn down. Look at that. That's pretty, I've never really looked at these kind of things side by side. You can see. Yeah, it's a little bit shorter as I've painted on it. Anyway, I just wanted a little bit of a different brush to, to mix some colors, and I need some more warm red. Ooh, that sound always gives me indigestion. <laughs> okay, 
So let's look at the color on the screen there. So I took some warm yellow, or sorry, warm red, and I'm gonna take a bunch of cool red, because we're trying to basically mix the color that's in between these colors. And then I'm gonna take some of this darker color, which we mixed earlier, which you recall was just warm red and cool blue. And I'm just using it to modify this color. This gives me just that a little bit more of a crimson uh, kind of shade here. Or not shade, hue. I'm also just thinking I should really, I would benefit by painting this, uh, this brown that's here, right next to the figure, is also on top of this figure. So you know what, I'm just going to wipe that away. Look how it peeled some of that, that other color right off. So let's, uh, I'm going to take my warm brown again. I think I'm gonna mix a little bit more of it. Uh, so I need some more warm yellow. So, you know, I apologize for the slight delay, but this is what happens when you're painting and you put a little bit of paint on the canvas and you see how it reacts. And then you go, oh, actually, I think I need to make a change here. So now we're gonna make that change. So I'm mixing another dark brown and I'm going to take again I'm going to take a bit of just cool blue and add it in here because it's going to sort of kill a little bit of the intensity of this color Oops, you can't see what I'm doing, can you? Duh. Hmm. You know what? I think I need to go back the other way. I think I need to go to a cool brown. It's just too warm of a color. And even after adding a bit of that yellow or uh, cool blue. So that's fine, let's go the other way. Let's take some, it's okay if I got a bit of white in there. Let's take this cool blue, cool red, or cool blue, cool yellow, and then let's take some cool red. as well. Okay, now we're getting closer to the color I want. This is all, it's all cool color. So it's cool red, cool blue, cool yellow. Okay, let's put some glazing fluid here. I'm gonna squeeze the rest of this paint off. And then get a different brush although yeah just for so just clean this brush off here yeah that's 
that's a bit of white that was on there, but what are you going to do, right? Zoom out. I think I can leave that. And then let's just take this, this color again with glaze. And then I'm just gonna go down into this foreground area and kind of just muck up this a bit. And then as I go into this right corner here, there's less glazing fluid and it gets a little bit more opaque. Let's put a bit more glazing fluid on there and just come back up and steal some more of a darker color. Gonna take that right off my brush here. Actually, maybe while I'm doing this, actually, you know, I'm just going to take my rag and just blur out these edges a little bit. I'm going to put more glazing fluid down in here. You know, I gotta blow dry this before I move forward. Otherwise, I was I was gonna go over it again, and I know that it always gives me a headache when I do that. So I'm gonna mute the microphone for a moment.
Okay, let's go back in here. As I said, I got more glazing fluid on there. And I want to do a bit more. This is very thin glazing fluid. Okay, should I do this figure just a little bit darker too? Lolly says, I have to leave because I have a naughty doggy. My glazing fluid is coming tomorrow, so maybe it's a blessing in disguise. I'm still watching, though. Okay. It is hard painting with children and pets around. I know what that's like for sure. They are, the minute you give your attention away to something else, they are going to do everything they can to steal it back. So... Uh, that's why I try to get my paintings done while our daughter is napping. <laughs> because otherwise, you've, I've done a few episodes where I've brought her down here while I've, and uh, did not go so well. Okay. Let's see. This glaze, I, I uh, you know, before I do that, I still got this paint that's a little bit wet on the canvas my palette here actually going to glaze with it be a little bit more peachy, couldn't it? Okay, so I mean, let's go back to that uh, crimson color we mixed a while ago here. All right, so this is my warm red, some cool blue. And then I also used my dark color, which was my cool blue and warm red, which I mixed together. And it's sort of like a, it's about the closest you can get to a black on your canvas. So I like using it for that purpose because it can it's almost like I'm giving a bit of shade to a um, hue
Oh, Lolly says, you, I love those episodes where your daughter <laughs> is, uh, is here. So that's very sweet of you to say that. I appreciate that. Um, okay. See, now this color previously was too red, too bright. It's now maybe a little bit on more on the dark side. So I think I'm just going to add a bit more cool red to it. I have a, a sneaking suspicion that I'm going to goof on the pattern here. Because I've sort of just drawn it out and skipped a few things. So I think it's going to look a little bit different than the original, but that's also very okay, right? You should feel allowed to play and make mistakes. Playing isn't just for children, right? So that's okay. Now let's take some white and I'll just mix this the same color right here. I think it needs a little bit more warm red. This was going a little bit too pink. Said it's going to diverge a bit from the original, and that's okay.
Okay. Let's paint the blue. So this blue, I think, is a combination of warm blue and cold blue together. And maybe a bit of white as well. And this dark color that we've used again, we'll take a bit of that. That's, yeah, okay, let's get some warm red. And we'll mix this in here. That's exactly what we need. Basically, it's it's modifying it with a gray is essentially what we're doing. Is we've taken a warm blue and cool blue, combine them together to get a little bit more of like a cobalt blue, which is he used cobalt blue. He used uh, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, and Prussian blue were really the primary uh, blues in his palette. Pretty good. It might be a little on the dark side. Just take a bit of white. But we are going to be doing a few glazes to brighten and darken things anyway. Part of what makes this little bit of the costuming a bit confusing is that he's he's actually done a very good job of observing because we have two patterns that are the same pattern but it meets in the center where you know, I assume this is where it uh, buttons up or um, so whereas I've just created one pattern going all the way across the entire uh, set of clothes. I'm not really, I haven't, I, I'm every once in a while glancing up at the original, but I'm not um, worried if I get it so-called wrong here. I didn't realize how far zoomed in I was, and I, you missed a bunch of that, didn't you? Okay. My apology. So basically, just seeing is there a big gap anywhere here that needs to be filled in? I think that's good. Okay. So let's, what's the next step here? I think the next step will be to paint, um, maybe we'll do faces next. Okay, yeah, let's do that. So, Lolly says, watching your streams has helped me to rediscover that art isn't always about perfection and is meant to be fun. It should never, I would never touch a paintbrush under the pressure of perfection. Now I love it again. 
I would go so far as to say, in echoing Ansel Adams, quote, that perfection is the enemy of art. Perfection has no place in art. People who go into art expecting perfection are going to um, be extremely disappointed, right? There's no place for perfection in art, as far as I'm concerned. The more obsessed you are with perfection, the more likely, more likely it is that you are going to get frustrated and stop making art. This is, I, I don't think Picasso is the best example of an artist who could care less about perfection. Right, and we just looked at three um, Indian artists uh, last week who, like Picasso, were very expressive, very loose in their painting style, and they were they they were trying to get away from a European perfection-focused uh, approach to painting, and it. Uh, it uh, led to them creating an entire movement of art, an entire style of art, and yeah, perfection is just, uh, and, and you know, that would be, you know, Leonardo, I think he was obsessed with perfection, he also had like some pretty kooky ideas about like alchemy and everything, um, but that it meant that he it took him years to make one painting to the f massive frustration of his uh of his patrons who got really upset with him and he that's he made many unfinished paintings um yeah and you could say well i guess if you make one mona lisa that's great maybe maybe that just doesn't seem like a particularly joyful way of, of, of living, right? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, Ansel Adams, art, or perfection is the enemy of art, is a really important, uh, we, I was just talking with my students at Emily Carr about this all day yesterday, because I make them read a great book called Art and Fear. So, let's, uh, let's mix a skin tone again. And I need some more colors on my palette here. So, let's mix some warm yellow, a little bit of warm red together. We have this right here, but I wanna mix it again. So it's nice and fresh while I'm painting with it. And just a touch of warm blue. Now, actually, as I look at this, these figures have are very pale. Alright, so I think I'm going to put a bit more red in there, but not too much. And you see there's some brown in there. I don't mind if it gets a little bit dirty. We need even more white in here. So let's start out with this color. I think it's it is still it needs more white in it. But oh, and you know what? I should do a little bit of outlining with a dark color because otherwise people are going to get lost. Okay, so let's before I go any further. Let's take, ah, I gotta mix more of that too. Okay, so let's take our warm red, warm blue, mix this up really quickly. Doesn't have to be perfect. And I'm just gonna use this to do some quick outlines. I mean, th these details here are very, very tiny, so. Um, 
don't worry about making it perfect. We're painting on a canvas that is a fraction of the size of the original. I think the original was um, it's almost life size, I'm pretty sure. So. That face kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, uh, what is it, the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer cartoon, is it Hanna-Barbera? <laughs> That's cool. Okay. So Lolly says, I appreciate you saying that because about perfection because your attitude has helped me rediscover what I used to love about art, but I got lost in the quest for perfection. It was no fun and I had no confidence. That makes me really happy to hear. Uh, you know, like when when you're obsessed with making things perfect, you know, it's it's hard to lose yourself and to just paint, right? Which is what I want to do. I just want to be painting. I just want to have fun. And if you're like, oh, I'm just, it's got to be perfect or otherwise it's it's ruined, then it, it's you can't loosen up. It's impossible to loosen up, right? Because you're, you're tight. You're flexing all the time. So, you know, it's the same sort of thing like, if you were making dinner and your your expectation was, well, it has to be better than the best chef on earth. It's got to be five Michelin stars. Otherwise, it's inedible. Well, then you're just always throwing your food out into the garbage, right? And the rest of your family is sitting at the dinner table like, um, or, uh, is anybody else hungry here? And you're like, well... I keep trying to make dinner, but you know it's it's not as good as like Gordon Ramsay or whatever. Uh, so uh, I guess we're just gonna order pizza again, right? Versus if you're just like, hey, you know, I did my best. I maybe I'm looking at a recipe and following a recipe, watching a video on how to do um, make my own pizza. And if it's not the best pizza ever, well, I'll learn from it, take a little bit of feedback make it again and as I do that it'll get better and better and better so let's uh, blow dry this not sure why I just want to do that with my finger as opposed to a brush but okay <laughs> let's I'm gonna blow dry the face so that I can apply some of my skin tone over time
Okay. Uh, Lolly says, I stopped even trying in the end. I love when your paintings make you laugh, Michael. At the at the little Harlequin's face and at the Bigfoot yesterday, that was a fun art lesson. I appreciate that again. I think you should laugh as much as possible, right? I think laughter is, is, um, is something we ought to be doing more of. It's fun to laugh. It feels good to laugh. And if you can't laugh at yourself, then boy, oh boy. All right. Also, I, I find like making a painting is always a little bit surprising. And sometimes you're just like, whoa, I, I, whoa, how did I, wh what's happened? Like, and, and that I think is pretty funny. Like there's something funny about me doing something and, and me surprising myself as almost as if I'm a different, another person watching things. <laughs> okay. Let's, um... size of brush. I'm just going to use this larger brush. So this is my skin tone that I mixed and not much of it left. Let's get a bit more white on here. All right, these are pretty pasty faces he's got going on so Thing with this hand here. So that'll dry and it'll be a little more transparent in a moment, but even if not, that's okay too. So I lost the shape of that thumb a bit, but I'm, I'll get it back later on. 
Uh, let's now put some white in here. So, let's just go right where we are right here. These ruffles. I always, whenever I see those kind of ruffles, I'm reminded of the the episode of Seinfeld where um, Jerry has to wear the puffy shirt. Because Kramer, is it Kramer's girlfriend is the quiet talker? It must be George. It must be Kramer, because Kramer's the only one who would hold somebody to going on television with a puffy shirt, right? Getting a little bit of that to go around behind the neck. Let's see. Oops, is this what's I think I didn't do the neck quite as far down, so that's okay. Rather than sit here and, and try to fix it, let's just go on about business and let this collar be higher than it, it was originally. So we'll put some glaze onto this side to, to darken that area. So I'm not even going to worry about trying to mix a, a different color, make it darker, or lighter, all that kind of stuff. details in place the white we're really trucking along pretty well it, it seemed like kind of a little slow in the middle but but we're 
getting there. Let's zoom back out. have done little white dots down here maybe let's just do that while I was got all that it kind of felt nice getting those details in so let's do that oh and the sword I'm gonna mix a bit of a a, a a gray here. So let's take a bit of this dark color, add a bit of yellow to it, so that when we add it to the white, it's gonna go gray. See, it's getting pretty sticky in here. some white details on top of that now the other side of that I think my line might be gone so let's just this same color maybe just a little bit more blue like he's got in there his is maybe even more teal but maybe we'll do that draw my line a little bit longer. Okay, I think that gets that into the right place, right? asks, you've done a lot of really exciting different forms of art in challenging unusual places. Do you have an experience that was your favorite? Good question. Let me think about that while I, I, I uh, move on here. Um...
So, I think I'll answer your question, but let me just stay on task because it drives people crazy when I just meander. So, uh, what do I want to do here next? We're going to do all of this this darkening stuff. I'll do those as just glazes later, so I'm not even going to worry about it. Maybe this, since I just had that gray, I could do a bit of this gray elsewhere. This is tricky, so I think, I don't know if I'm going to do it exactly the way he did, because um, he painted this on here, and then he's wiped the paint off a few times. It is a pretty cool effect. Maybe I'll paint this gray. Maybe even a lighter gray. Lighter gray, let's take a bit of cool yellow in here. And then when we glaze over it later, we'll, we'll darken it and then wipe that paint away to get that kind of similar effect that he had. It's just quite tricky because we're working on a much smaller surface, so doing things like that are, are hard, harder to do. Like, he's working on a painting that is much much bigger in fact let's I can't even remember how big this painting is 191 by wow so that this is a big paint this is almost two feet tall which is two feet is um, is almost what like six seven feet or something so this is a it's a big painting like most most people, or sorry, two meters is is like yeah, yeah seven eight feet. It's that's really tall. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's, let's take this. I'm gonna go darker. So doing that kind of thing, wiping paint away, that's fun and easy to do. Oh, I just noticed this hand over here, which I forgot. Let's, let's do the, let's finish these faces right now. I think that would probably give people some satisfaction. So let's just start up a little bit higher so I can. Um, let's mix our dark color one more time. In fact, let's do a bigger batch of it. paint fell off my my palette onto the canvas so I just clean that up okay so let's go back to these faces
So I mean again, look how, I mean this is the size of my pinky finger and the, that face, right? So there's not a lot of room to work here. So I'm pretty forgiving with myself for what I'm able to accomplish in such a tight space as you should be. This is just my darkest color. This is just basically it's close to a black, but not black because I think black would just be a little bit too intense. Let's just keep on going down here. more to that but let's let's just move on and do the child here that or the young acrobat or young harlequin my apology I'm gonna wait, I'm not gonna do anything more to that hat at the moment. Ah, all, all my dark color. I should just mix a new batch, but it's just, it's all sticky and goopy and... I'm just gonna put a bit of glazing fluid in here just to activate it a bit. And I don't mind if I get a little bit more of a transparent color either.
let's take care of these hands. other hand is sort of like in a in the the belt right resting in the belt I don't really. Oh, uh, I guess I'd answer Lolly's question there. Sorry, I was zoned out while I was painting here. Sometimes it's, I almost like forget that, <laughs> that I'm doing this online and people might be watching. And um, okay, let me just. Mm. Okay, I'm going to have to get more paint on my palette. I need more of uh, 
my darkest color just for outlining and, and ultimately for a glaze later on. So this is warm red and cool blue and a bit of cool yellow. So uh, again, essentially this is my darkest color on my palette. It looks a lot like a very, very dark gray. So not black, it doesn't go totally black, but it gets pretty close, close enough that uh, you don't need to use a black. Although if you do use a black, you will see a little bit of a difference, which some people might like. They might like being able to, to do this and then just do a couple quick little pops of black. I mean, just look how like loosely he's painting down here, and that's that's almost like a full-sized human shoe that he's painting there, and yet he's just like dashed it in. That takes a lot of confidence. Some would say like like he's showing off here and just showing like, hey. I can do a whole foot in like t three brush strokes, which that's very Picasso like. I mean, he's throughout his career was would do things like that. did before was like a very thin glaze to get a black line even though it's not really there I think I just need one in my painting um, and then I want this hand that's in the shadow but I'm gonna if I have anything remotely like a skin tone So it means I've got to adjust Let's continue on to the, I want to do the details on the, the acrobat here. There's the acrobat's belt. This this little thing, white thing that just
you know, it's at this point in the painting, you know, like my hands are have got paint on them and I'm just, they're kind of sticky and that paint just start, starts coming off all over the place. And... <laughs> Paula says the background needs some work. Ah, okay. Where do you think the background needs work, Paula? Good idea, yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite done there. I'm, I'm gonna do some glazing and things back there, so... I appreciate your attention to detail. <laughs> uh, let's, we'll put some... Well, actually, let's put a bit of black in this now, and then I'll put some white and...
So to go to the Lolly's question, what is my favorite experience? Um, art making experience. Um, Well, obviously making art in a fighter plane and going to the North Pole were pretty uh, awesome experiences. Um, and I'm pretty lucky to have had those uh, experiences through the um, War Artist Program here in Canada. Uh, Trying to, trying to think of another thing that I've done that was pretty wild. Maybe some. What is. I mean, I've had a lot of experiences working in and collaborating with different groups. Um, Like one of the really fun things that I did a few years ago was working as a as a challenge producer on a television show for the CBC, which here in Canada is like well, in like Australia, it's like the ABC. It's a like the Australian Broadcasting Company or Corporation, ABC in Australia or PBS in the United States. So I helped produce a television show, which the year before I was one of the um, the featured artists on, and then they came back. They hired me to come back the next year to help create um, the show. That show is called Crash Gallery, and it's uh, Crash Gallery was kind of like a reality TV show uh, about fine art. That was a lot of fun, being on set and helping to develop it. And um, one of the things that we did is we had people painting underwater, which I was sure was going to become like a viral hit sensation. But the show aired opposite the Super Bowl. So not many people, I don't know why they scheduled it so poorly, but they uh, they did, so barely anybody actually watched the episode. It is available online, but um, so you can watch it there. But anyway, so let's come back out. I think really, Zoom all the way out so we can just see side by side what these look like. Um, <laughs> this guy's face looks a little bit shorter. It's funny how it seems to have squished down. there's any brown left life left in this brown so I'm gonna put some glaze in here Let's see if I can there reactivate this was a cold brown that I had here before and I'm gonna paint with it so it's gonna be mostly transparent Just for you, Paula, we'll, we'll go right into the towers back here, right?
Uh, I'm trying to give other cool experiences. Those lines are a little bit dark. So I'm just going to kind of soak it up a bit. Just like kind of sponge it off. don't really know what's going on back here. It's hard to... So I'm just using my best guess to create something in here. This face now. So I have to mix a bit more. Mm. Too much red. Some warm yellow, a little bit of warm red, a bit of warm blue and white. So now we're just going to give a bit more nuance to this face. Let's see, do the hands need it? And not really. He keeps the hands pretty simple. This 
other little hand on the shoulder. He does this as a gray here, and I'll do that as a glaze. We'll darken it a bit. I just want to give a bit more of a bit more skin tone on mine. That might have been a little much. I think it's time we do a little something on this helmet here, or not helmet, hat. <laughs> so I'm going to take uh, my darkest color, get it on here. Put it in place and then I'm going to wrap up. Oh, what happened here? Um, hmm. got this rag wrapped around my finger pretty close not quite exactly like that might have been a little more vertical brush strokes but again that rag is much bigger than um, like that's almost a life-size human head and hat that he's painting here mine is the size of a postage stamp so <laughs> it's a little hard to, to get that same effect but essentially that's what he would have done And even that face is even more pasty now that I'm looking at it. So let's get it, make, make it a little more pasty than that. Let's take our warm red, warm yellow combo.
let's come up to this other face, see if there's not nearly as, as radical. Okay, so as I'm getting closer to the end here, we'll do a bit of work on the sword and on the, the the vase of flowers in the background there. So this uh, vase of flowers, we got some cool yellow, I think, in here. I think I'm going to just use this paint that I made for the face. Let's see how much far, how far I can get with that. brushy you could do this as a glaze as well because um, I want to keep the paint that was there underneath coming through and when you're using white that can be a little bit tricky so having a bit of a drier brush and that just means as a dry brush I, I'm not I'm kind of putting on thin coat of paint that I can kind of wipe away if I want. And then as the brush starts to run out of paint, that's actually really highly desirable to the point where if you're doing this, you may even want to take your brush and wipe off before you paint. So let's I'll get a bit more on here. Like right now, I still need a little bit more paint, so I'm kind of... I paint the big areas that need lots of paint, and then I, as the brush dries, then I can use that to paint elsewhere. So for instance, I'm going to take this and just take off that excess so that now I can go in here and scrub in. Uh, 
Um, let's make a dark green. So I'm going to take some warm blue and I got a bit of this warm yellow still here on its final not much left that's okay because I just want it a little bit to in fact I could even put a little bit more blue in here darker in places. I'm just going to come back to my white here and just get some pure white. Maybe a bit of that color I was using before, but mostly white. So let's zoom out. I, there's very few things I want to do left here. Really, I think at this point, all I want to do is a bit of uh, darker glaze, and then I think we're done. So um, I just. A little bit of cool blue. So last but not least, what I want to do is take my darkest color here, I'm going to glaze with it, so I'm going to get glazing fluid on my brush, so I, there's basically nothing, no color right now, right? And then let's get a little bit of this dark color. All right, you can see how it now you know, changes the color, but there's barely any of it on there. So we're gonna use this to do things, and I'll, let's get an a, you can use any brush, you could use a rag too, but I'm gonna use what's called a mop brush to 
do any blending. In fact, I'm going to use a bigger brush to get in these. So there's a lot of this kind of stuff on here, and maybe I could have done this before I did the flower up here. to let that dry so let's actually let's go back down to a smaller brush use that mop brush just to smooth things out. In fact, let's zoom back in.
Let's zoom back out. Once again, Picasso doesn't put a shadow here, which I think is odd. So I'm just going to add a little something. So let's uh, blow dry this before I do, because I want to do another bit of glazing up in the air here.
Yes, I was on mute. I don't know how long I've been on mute. Probably for 10 minutes or so. Thanks for letting me know there. Um, I appreciate that, Lolly. Okay, I think I'm just going to finish up here. Do I have any more cool yellow? A little bit of it. Okay, cool. So that sword is definitely um, brighter than the original, but there's also a few other things in my painting that are different anyway, so I kind of felt a little bit justified. Like for instance, this here, I, I, I remember doing a glaze of a little bit more of an or orangey color and, and maybe a little bit too warm in the background. Um, this I could still do another pass so just these little details that kind of irk me but I mean overall the whole painting is there just slightly different which is also okay it doesn't have to be exactly like the original painting okay So, twenty first today, I think. Okay. Paint on the microphone. Uh, why don't I just take a second before I leave. Let's just see how our wall of Picasso's. Look here. So over just three days of painting, we've got three totally different Picasso paintings. Child with a Dove, the old guitarist, and then the acrobat with young Harlequin. 1901, 1903, 1905. And we can even maybe if we put these here in this order right you could see this is from you know he's what eight 19 years old I think when he does this he's like 21 when he does this he's like 23 when he does this so this is his depressive phase this is the beginning of the de the beginning well yeah right the very very end and very very beginning of the that depressive phase and then coming back out in more brighter colors. And then as we move into the next painting, I think you'll see a transition to these much more uh, 
the, mostly browns and reds and oranges and yellows. And then of course, by the time we get to our painting on Monday, where we're painting the Weeping Woman, it is just an explosion of color. Lots of bright primary colors, yellows and greens, really um, different than anything that we have here so far. Cool, so that makes me happy. It makes me, it's, I've, it's really neat to see them all together like that. Okay, if you enjoyed today's episode, please like, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell so you know when I'm doing spontaneous live streams. And I might be doing a little bit more of that. I might start actually working on my graphic novel just randomly going live. And if people want to hang out and watch the creation of that graphic novel, which I've been working on for years, but now my publisher really wants it done as soon as possible. So I might do that as a way of uh, just opening up the studio. I love just painting around and having people check in and out. Um, also, if you want to contribute a PayPal donation, there's the link down below. If you want to send a check or e-transfer, you can use my email on my website, or you can contact me through the Facebook group. And join the Facebook group. Upload your version of any of these paintings or anything else you've been working on, and we will do a feedback episode. Uh, I know I'm a little bit behind on that, but just been very, very busy lately. So I'm off to have dinner with the in-laws. Hope you're doing well wherever you are on our beautiful planet Earth. And we shall see you all again on Saturday when we paint Picasso's three musicians. It's one painting with three musicians. Okay, everyone, we will see you then. Good night.